And we're going to go back and read from verse 9 to verse 14. I want you to have this beautiful prayer lodged in your mind. I want you to follow me in your Bibles. Beginning in verse 9 of Colossians 1, Paul says, For this cause or this reason we, and he's including himself with the uh, pastor there, uh, Epaphras and Timothy, we since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy, verse 10, of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, I love that, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Giving thanks is our text for today, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, or literally the Son of his love, in whom, verse 14, that is Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of our sins. I love the story of the two farm boys who were walking into town and they decided to cut through a farmer's yard or or pasture. So they climbed the fence and they were walking along through this pasture. To their horror, they looked up and there was a bull coming after them. So they took off running for the fence and as they were running, one of the boys said to the other, he goes, you better pray because we're in trouble The other boy says, I don't know any prayers. He goes, well, pray something. He goes, well, I'll pray the prayer my dad used to pray every time we ate. And so he's running from the bull. He prays, Lord, for what we're about to receive, make us truly thankful. (laughs) Now, I do believe you should pray in a moment like that, but that's probably not the best prayer to pray in a moment like that. But my question to you this morning is, what are you thankful for? Maybe you're thankful for your husband, you're thankful for your wife, maybe you're thankful for your children, thankful for your grandchildren, thank you for health, thank you for provision, all the things that we can be thankful for. By the way, this is a great Thanksgiving text we have for us this morning. What are you thankful for? Paul the Apostle was a man who always thanked God for his salvation. If nothing else, we can thank God for salvation, amen? Amen. And what we're going to have today, theologians would call a passage that deals with soteriology, to use a big theological term, means salvation. And we're going to see three things about our salvation that we can be thankful for, as Paul teaches us in this passage, to be thankful. Notice in verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father. So our thanksgiving is directed toward God the Father, and the Bible says it's from Him that all blessings come. He's no, there's no changing or variableness or shadow of turning, and he's the one who gives good things to us. So we're thankful to the Father. So Paul was a man with a thankful heart. He's praying for the believers in Colossae, number one, back up to verse nine, that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will. So there's really the first petition in verse nine, spiritual intelligence. And then the second p- petition is in verse 10, that they would walk worthy of the Lord, practical obedience. So the first two petitions are spiritual intelligence. Second one is practical obedience. Now we come to the third in verse 12 to 14, humble thankfulness. So if I were going to summarize the whole prayer, it would basically be Paul saying, I pray that you might be enlightened, know the will of God and the word of God spiritually. I pray that you might live practically a worthy walk, and that you might thank God humbly for all the blessings that He has given us. And I think what a great summary of things to pray for. That we might know, that we might do, that we might respond in thanksgiving to all the blessings that God has given to us. So He wanted them to have a worthy walk, which is pleasing, verse 10, which is fruitful, verse 10, which is growing, verse 10, and which is a powerful, powerful walk, verse 10. 11. But all of it is summarized in this first statement, giving thanks unto the Father. Now, I want you to note, lest I forget these key, this key phrase, in verse 12, hath made us. In verse 13, hath 
delivered us, and verse 13, hath translated us, and then verse 14, we have. I can't say enough about it, and I always kind of veer off my notes and my outline, but it's just so heavy on my heart that you understand all that is yours the moment you are saved. So many Christians flounder through their Christian life thinking they have to earn merit or deserve or do better to get God to love them so they can go to heaven or that God can bless them. Paul is going to be teaching us what God the Father through God the Son and the God the Holy Spirit has done for us when we were saved. So it's such an important principle, learning what you have in Christ. You know you can't enjoy what you don't know you have. If you've stashed some money or cash in a sock drawer and you forget about it, you can't really enjoy it if you need it because you don't know it's there. I'm telling you this because this happened to me. I'll put some cash in a drawer somewhere and I'll forget about it. And then maybe months later, I think, man, wait, you know, I wish I had some money. I'd do this. And, you know, and it's like, and then I'll find it afterward. And go, man, I wish I would have known that was there. <laughs> so you can't enjoy what you don't know you have, right? So you need to know what you have in Christ. And I can't emphasize enough that this is true of every Christian. Not just the deeper life club. Not just the super saint. Oh, that's not true of me because I don't pray enough. That's not true of me because I'm not good enough. All Christians share equally in these blessings that we can be thankful for as Paul delineates them in this passage. There are three blessings every Christian should be thankful for. It's very simple, but simply profound. I want you to write them down. Verse 12, that God the Father has qualified us or made us fit for heaven. Notice verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father. Why? Because He's made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Someday I want to go back and preach a sermon on each one of these blessings. Being thankful to God that He has made us fit. Now what does it mean in the King James translation has made us meet? It's actually made us fit. Or better rendering would be qualified us. So if you're taking notes, you can put that in the margin of your Bible or in your notes. God, the Father, has qualified us or made us fit or ready to go to heaven. Now, before you were saved, you were only qualified or fit for what? Hell. Just thought I'd encourage you. You go, ah, the sermon was sounding pretty good until you mentioned the word hell. Are you going to be one of those hellfire preachers? Now I'm going to be a biblical preacher, and it's biblical to tell you the truth. Amen? Before you were born again, you were qualified. You were fit for hell. So you never pray, God, give me what I deserve, because you deserve hell. But now that you're born again, if you're saved, and you've been regenerated, given new life, you're a Christian, you are now fit, you're qualified to go to heaven. That's what he's saying. If I were to paraphrase this, you were born again, you were fit or qualified to go to heaven. Now, again, this is not referring to our character, which is our practice. That's the doctrine of sanctification. This is referring to our position in Christ, which is our standing, which is justification. Now, the moment you were born again, the the Bible tells us that we were justified. Justification is the act of God where He declares the believing sinner to be righteous, qualified, based on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, let me illustrate. If you've been a Christian for 30 years, you're not more saved than you were the day you got saved. So I've been a Christian 40 years. I'm like super saved now. I'm like a super saved. I'm in the deeper, deeper, deeper life club. You're not more saved than when you, the moment you believed in Jesus. But you should be, listen carefully, more sanctified. That means you should be more like Jesus Christ. If you aren't growing in the likeness of Christ, then you're not growing as a Christian. It doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. It just means you're not growing, and God wants us to grow now that we're saved. But you've got to keep those two categories in your mind. Every Christian has been justified 
are declared righteous, and nothing you can do is going to make you more righteous as time goes on. And that's what he's talking about. God has qualified us or made us fit. So it's not talking about our practice, but our, uh, he's talking about our position that we have in Christ. It means the moment you were saved or born again, you were qualified for heaven. Let me give you another illustration. The thief on the cross. Now there were two thieves. One reviled and cursed Jesus and was lost, no doubt, when he died. But the other thief turned in faith to Jesus. And what did he say? Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. What did Jesus say? Sorry, you messed up. You're a crook. You're dying because you've broken the law. You're going to get your just judgment, your punishment. And besides that, you haven't been baptized. You don't go to church. And you really need a haircut. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't say that? He just said to this man, he said, today, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And that moment, that call, that prayer, that cry out to Jesus in that very moment, that man was justified before God. The Bible says, by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And to think that he could live that kind of a life but in the last moments, he could cry out to you. talk about a deathbed conversion. Lord, remember me. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And those that have been born again have been qualified for heaven. And I believe in verse 12, that's what he's qualified us for. Notice it says, partakers of the inheritance, verse 12, of the saints in light. Now we're going to see that we have been delivered and transferred in verse 13. But in verse 12, he introduces that concept of inheriting what the saints do in life. So the moment you're saved, you're translated into God's kingdom, you inherit the kingdom of God. But when you die, you're going to go to heaven or the Lord comes to take you home. I, I believe that it's a primarily a reference to one day we will go to heaven. In the Old Testament, Israel inherited a physical promised land was all the provision and work of God. For us, it starts now by the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, but one day we're going to go to heaven. The Holy Spirit is the down payment, the engagement ring. It's the foretaste of what we're going to have in heaven. So it's saying that we have been actually qualified and made fit to go to heaven. I love what R. Kent Hughes said. He said, one day we will pass beyond the stars and when they have burned themselves out, we will shine even brighter. What a blessing that is. So number one, we should be thankful to God the Father that He has qualified us, you might say justified us, or made us fit to go to heaven. Here's the second blessing, write it down. We thank God the Father because He has delivered us and transferred us, verse 13. Notice it. Who has delivered us, from the power of darkness, he has translated us to the kingdom of his dear son. Stop right there. The verb Paul used, delivered and transferred, is only used in the New Testament for a work of God. And it indicates something very important, that God is the one who delivers us. God is the one who transfers us or translates us or transports us from the kingdom of darkness and the power of sin and Satan to the kingdom of His dear Son, the power of light and righteousness. You see, our greatest need is the need for forgiveness of sins. And that's what he's going to point out at the end of verse 14, that our sins have been forgiven. But it's all the work of first qualifying us and then transferring us. Now, all of this happened the moment you were born again. It's not progressional. It's not postponed. You don't work for it. It's provided for by God instantaneously. We were helpless, and only God could deliver us or rescue us. Our greatest problem is sin. Mankind's greatest problem is sin. And no scientist or philosopher or psychiatrist 
or educator or politician can solve man's greatest problem. Our greatest problem is sin. Remember the angels that sang when Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Unto you is born this day in the city of David, what? A Savior. Not a politician. (laughs) Not a philosopher. Not a scientist. Not a military leader. A Savior. Why? Because that's what we needed. God sent someone to rescue us. And that's what he's conveying in this idea of deliver us. Only God can deliver us from sin and Satan. Notice in verse 13, delivered us from the power. The word power there means jurisdiction or authority of darkness. So Satan's power, authority, jurisdiction over us, he's delivered us. And he sent the Son Jesus to do that. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. So the coming of the Lord is a rescue mission to rescue us from sin's power and sin's penalty. Now, this is the negative side of our salvation. But notice now the positive side. Not only does God deliver us from Satan and his kingdom of darkness, but verse 13 says, he's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And in the Greek, it's beautiful. It's actually the son of his love. The dear son is a reference to the son of his love. Remember when Jesus was baptized and the father spoke audibly from heaven? And he said what? This is my beloved son in whom my soul delights. So Jesus is that beloved son and we're transferred from Satan's kingdom to God's kingdom, the son of his dear love. And the word translated in the King James is better transferred. It was used to describe the deportation of a population from one country to another. Even as Israel ends up in Egypt, And then they had to be redeemed. And we're going to see that in verse 14. So we were in Satan's kingdom. All of us before salvation were living in Satan's kingdom. We were children of the devil. And we needed to be transferred to the kingdom of Christ, the son of his dear love. This is true of all Christians the moment they are saved. And every human being on planet earth is living in one of these two kingdoms. You're either living in the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. Kingdom of God or the kingdom of Satan. And when you get saved, you're transferred to God's kingdom from Satan's kingdom. We, as God's children, live in God's kingdom of light and love. And it's not just a future kingdom. It is, but it's now as well. Every morning we should wake up and thank God, I have been qualified for heaven I have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. But let me give you the third and last thing we should be thankful for. It's in verse 14. And that is the Father has redeemed us. Look at it with me. In whom, at the end of verse 13, there's a mention of the Son of His love, Jesus Christ. Then without skipping a beat, in whom, that is in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins there's a lot of important information and doctrine in that verse about redemption i want to give you five facts about redemption from verse 14 first of all notice that it's in christ verse 14 in whom only jesus can redeem us he is the Redeemer. That's going to be the theme of heaven. It's a theme of all Scripture. Cut the Bible anywhere it bleeds. It's red with redemptive truth. We were sinners. God sent His Son to rescue us, to redeem us. So Jesus is the Redeemer. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the what? The life. And then He added... No one comes to the Father except by me. So only Jesus can redeem fallen mankind. Notice, secondly, the certainty of our redemption. The little phrase in verse 14, we have. In whom, Jesus, we have. So our redemption is certain. Again, put John 3.16 alongside that thought. 
For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but what? Have. Have. Not hope to have, not might have, not maybe have. Have everlasting life. You can know that you have been saved and forgiven and fit for heaven when you trust Jesus Christ. You can have eternal life. Now, notice thirdly, it's meaning. Verse 14. Re. Redemption. That's a great, great Bible word, redemption. The word means to purchase and set free by paying a price. It has all those facets in the word redeem. We're bought, we're set free, and then we were bought with a price. The price was the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. So we were slaves to sin. Jesus, by His death, on the cross, bought us and set us free. You know, a slave in the Bible days could actually redeem himself by saving up money. Sometimes they did get paid as slaves, and then they could actually buy their freedom. But you know, we can't do that. Someone said, we owed a debt we couldn't pay. He paid a debt he didn't owe. So we were bankrupt spiritually. We were all dead in sin. But Jesus came and paid the price to buy us and to release us and set us free. When we were in uh, uh, South Carolina recently, we saw some of the slave markets that existed from long ago where people would go and buy a slave. Well, we were all slaves to sin. And God came and God actually purchased us and bought us so that we could be set free. So our redemption is in Christ. It certainly we have. And its meaning is we've been bought and set free. But notice number four about our redemption, verse 14. It's through His blood. Now I know that some modern translations omit that statement. You might have a Bible that doesn't have it. The King James translation has through His blood. Two things. The oldest manuscripts have it in them, though it's not as many because they're older. But we also find that the doctrine of His blood redeeming us is consistent all through the Bible. That's the scarlet thread through all of Scripture. So it says that we're redeemed by His blood. Write down Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of our sins. Write down Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, having made peace through the blood of His cross. So the price of our redemption was the blood or literally the death of Jesus Christ. Now let me make something very clear that's important. Whenever the New Testament uses the phrase, the blood of Christ, it's not talking so much about the actual physical blood that Jesus shed on the cross. It's a euphemism or phrase that conveys the idea of the total work on the cross. It's a phrase used in the Bible to describe His substitutionary atoning death on the cross. So instead of explaining it in those full words, the Bible just uses the word, the blood of Christ. So when it uses that phrase, the blood of Christ, it's talking about His crucifixion. And it's talking about the fact that it was a substitution. And that's the heart of the cross. When Jesus died on that cross, He wasn't just laying down His life to show you how much God loves you or to teach you that we should sacrifice to love other people. He was actually paying a price for your sins and mine. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. He paid it. He died on the cross. Though He was sinless, He died to take our sins and to pay its penalty. So how were we redeemed? Through the blood, through the cross, through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Write down 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19. 1 Peter 1, 18-9, we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, received by tradition from our fathers, but with what? The precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we sing about the blood. We thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Some modern churches that are turning away from Scripture have taken the hymns out of their hymnals on the blood of Jesus Christ. Preachers don't preach on the blood of Christ anymore. We don't sing songs about the blood of Christ. 
You're, all, you're always hearing me quote old hymns. I grew up in the church and I used to love hearing that song, Are You Washed in the Blood? In the Precious Blood of the Christ. And that's a question we need to ask ourselves. Have I been washed in the blood of Jesus? Only that can wash us and cleanse us from all sin. You can't get there on your own. You need a Redeemer. So God sent His Son. And Jesus entered the world through the womb of the Virgin Mary, took on full humanity, maintained His full deity, so the God-man went to the cross and died on the cross for you and I. The death of Christ was also a propitiation, which means that He died to satisfy the law of God the Father, the demands of God the Father, the soul that sins shall surely die. And I believe it was a universal death for all mankind, but only those who by faith appropriate what Jesus did for them will be saved. We don't automatically go to heaven because Jesus died. You must believe in Jesus by trusting Him in faith. That's the only way you can be saved. So number one, we were translated, or we were made fit, excuse me. Number two, we were translated and delivered. And number three, we were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice also the results, fifthly, in verse 14. What happened when we were redeemed? Even the forgiveness of our sins. Awesome. Our sins have been forgiven. You know what the word forgiveness means? It means to send away. In Psalm 103, verse 12, David said, For as far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. You know, this was seen in what was called the scapegoat. You heard the term scapegoat comes from the Old Testament. They would put their hands on a goat and symbolically transfer their sins to that goat. And then they would actually chase the goat off into the distant hills, and it would be a picture watching as that goat disappeared over the hills. There go my sins. I don't know what they did the next morning if he's on the front porch. <laughs> ah! Freak out. Throw rocks at it. Get away, goat. <laughs> but you know, the Bible says that Jesus carried our sins away and He separates them from as far as the east is from the west, never to be brought up again. That's why John the Baptist said, look, behold, the Lamb of God who carries away. There's forgiveness. The sin of the world. So Jesus came to be the substitute to pay our price to die for our redemption on the cross. Even the forgiveness of our sins. First thing we experience when we are born again is the joy of sins forgiven. That's the initial experience of being born again. The joy of sins forgiven. And we should be forever grateful and thankful. Now let me summarize the closing of this prayer. Number one, we have been qualified or made fit for heaven. Write down the word light, verse 12. We're going to inherit heaven. Then in verse 13, we have been delivered from Satan's kingdom of darkness and transferred unto the kingdom of his son. Write down the word love. And then in verse 14, we have been redeemed by the death of Jesus on the cross and our sins have been forgiven, write down the word liberty. So we have light, verse 12, love, verse 13, and liberty in verse 14. What an amazing description of our salvation. God is qualified, has made us fit for heaven. Before that, I wasn't fit for anything but hell. God has transferred me from Satan's kingdom to God's and delivered me from the power of darkness. Sin's penalty and power have been broken in my life. And then thirdly, He's redeemed me. How? By the blood of His own dear Son, Jesus, who died on the cross in my place, paid the penalty for my sins that I might be forgiven. My sins can be carried away. So my closing question is, have you been qualified? And secondly, have you been transferred out of Satan's kingdom to God's? And thirdly, have you been redeemed? You say, well, I don't know. Well, then make sure. Don't leave here without knowing. 
Nothing would be more insane than coming to church and hearing about salvation and not having salvation. Nothing could be more insane than saying, well, I, I, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm going to hell. I know Jesus is the Savior, but I'm just not ready yet. The Bible says now is the acceptance time. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts. If you're not sure that you're going to heaven, then make sure today. You say, well, how do I do that? Number one, realize that you are a sinner. Number two, repent. Turn from your sins. And number three, receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Trust Him today. If God has spoken to you through this message today and you're not sure that you're a child of God, maybe you don't know for sure that if you died today that you would go to heaven, you've never really trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would like to lead you in a prayer right now, inviting Christ to come into your heart and to be your Savior. So as I pray this prayer, I want you to repeat it out loud, right where you are, after me. Make it from your heart inviting Christ to come in and be your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I pray that you'll forgive me and come into my heart and make me your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. I believe in you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God heard that prayer, and I believe that God will and does forgive your sins. We'd like to help you get started growing in your walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you. If you just prayed with Pastor John to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are so excited for you. And we'd like to send you a Bible and some resources to get you started in your relationship with the Lord. Simply click on the contact link at the top of the page. And tell us something like, I prayed to accept Christ. We'll get your Bible and resources mailed out to you right away. God bless you and welcome to the family of God.